now invite me to to please come on the stage and share her thoughts and let me share with you all that is a little tragic thing uh, in spite of you know mithu it is something to say about somebody's professional commitment her mother in law expired day for yesterday and she was in calcutta then jamshedpur and she specifically his family his, her, fa- her husband husband's brother they said me to you must live up to your com- professional commitments you must go and then she not only that like because of uh, she had to travel 3 hours in in car from jamshedpur to ranchi then in delhi because of the strike the taxi people kind of you no know, refused to kind of you no know, uh, um, take her to the station so he said i will take you at 5 o'clock in the morning the train starts at 7:40 so from 5 till 7:40 she was sitting on the railway station to come to chandigarh this morning so i really admire you i really thank you for your bravery for your commitment to art to your profession thank you with in recent times there's been much debate over the role of art with most people who are in the line of fire asserting that their art particularly films and music is meant to entertain and nothing else and giri shahane on the other hand has hinted that artists may be may be working from the standpoint of a guilty conscience but when an artist titles her exhibition i hate pink or free me too you can be sure that the aim is not entertainment but subversion of gender stereotypes and social critique poet painter sculptor installation artist and innovator mithu sen's over encompasses scathing social commentaries as in twilight zone no star no land no word no commitment black candy or drawing room deeply conceptual her combinations of sculpture video sound drawings and poetry make bold statements that engage viewers in the politics of identity sexuality and gender positioning herself portraits in many of these along with ubiquitous objects such as hair hangers chappals and household items she swings between intimacy and distance creating a rich blend of fact and fiction for being all born me to sen it was perhaps but inevitable that she should study art at chatiniketan where she earned her bachelor's and master's degrees further study at the glasgow school of art in uk followed and then group as well as solo exhibitions from 2000 onwards she has exhibited her works in prestigious museums galleries in india new york vienna singapore zurich and taipei Her most recent solo show Devoid was held in Paris. Recipient of the Skoda Award 2010 for the best contemporary artist in India, Mithu Sen has also been awarded many pre- prestigious residencies in New York, Brazil, China, Austria, Kenya, Japan and South Africa. Two collections of her poems have been published. Today Mithu Sen shall give us a glimpse of her provocative humorous and insightful work while saying stay politically incorrect forever thank you thank you thank you everybody for coming and thank you lalit kala and especially divan ji <laughs> as you all know i am i get very nervous especially while i have to uh, express my works in in words uh, because uh, i'm still searching for a language where i can fit and explain the best way i can and i today's time i think like i really don't know where it's if it is like visual language or a uh, literary language um i will start with uh, my slides uh, so that i can this is one of my self portrait um uh, i was asked for a show curated show for self portrait and i sent this one um how i'm called and spelled by friends people from all over which 
actually, since uh, um, I think most of the artists talk about identity, and which is like a common thing for not only for the artists, but all of us. We search for an identity, and all our life we go through a crisis, and we look for a specific um, definition of it. Um, so I found something, which is here. Um, I, I was born in Bengal, in Calcutta, but then since I was, soon after I was born, my father was posted in North Bengal, and I grew up in many small suburbs in Bengal. And uh, my mother is a poet, and my desire was only to be a poet in my life. So I was following her like ritually. I started writing very early. And um, it became a huge issue when I shifted to Delhi and still uh, tried to continue my poems in, in my native language, in Bengali where I had a strong pride and maybe a ego. I could not, or maybe I did, overcome that, that, um, that struggle. So my poems started becoming less and less in words, and in one point, it totally became a void. So my last book, which was published like for 10 years of my collection, many pages I left blank just to express those moments where I could not express my, my, my poems and my feelings in words, but who still exist. I mean, recently, since Manaji uh, mentioned that my mother-in-law passed away two days ago, and she, I was really close to her. And while I was touching her feet, the coal field, because I reached quite late. You know, that, that kind of that warmth from that cold body I was getting. And I was questioning myself how really we think about being and not being. So this, she is so much. Yeah, I don't want to bring this um, sad story. Because for me, she is still here. Because for me, I mean, Upanishada also says like there is nothing called like non-existence. So it's everything exists. So I also believe that, and I started writing and like experimenting with my poems like this, you know, in forms and shapes, with bodies and with also the blank pages, where there is no such body but existence. And I wanted to establish that part that blankness also is something. Even my recent show, Devoid, is something about that. Well, this is some of one of my graffiti work. Well, I'm often called feminist which I agree and also don't agree. Um, so um, when I came to Delhi, I was trying to develop my own language. I was struggling to develop my, you know, my belongings, my rootedness somewhere. So I was taking that words, because the word comes fast to me. Even when I send this, um, that, that uh, title of this speech, what is that called? I even forget. Um, stay politically incorrect forever. I just love that sentence. I am a collector, collector of many things as well as words. So this work was uh, in a residence in New York where I was working for a month along with 25 other artists from all over the world. And that time I was working. Uh, with materials related with body, like blood and hair and teeth and many things. So this is like artificial hair. Uh, and I, was, I started writing something on the wall that the room I was given. It looks like a letter with an address and something, and it's quite huge in scale. So from the very beginning, everybody, my fellow artists, were very curious what I was writing about. So I, I, I promised them that at the last day I will explain, I will translate that letter to them. At the end, the opening day, I actually wrote a little note in a paper and gave it to my people, like friends and all. 
asking them to translate it for me because I even don't know this non-textual, these imaginary words, what does it say. These are all like, you know, imagination and just to play a game to me and to this, to this, uh, my fellow friends and, uh, you know, the people who are there because how they react and how they really uh, interact with me, me as, a, as an artist from India and staying over there for a month, you know, period. So everybody really tried, the artist age group was from 25 to 75. But how sincerely and honestly everybody tried to say something, that made me surprised because that you know, made me feel that, you know, they love art and also quite interestingly, they, everybody in a way becomes a child and engage into a kind of game. So I often do this while I travel or don't travel I, with my work, with my art. I try to engage my viewer. My viewer, my audience works 50% of my, so I don't want to take all the credits except the Skoda Award I got on. <laughs> this is, and uh, I, I, I keep on doing exhibitions where I always like to um, play with the space. I don't, I, I get easily bored just making some works in the, ex, uh, in the studio and send it for a show. So unless it becomes a part of the space, I don't feel comfortable. Uh, even, I want to, you know, give a home to my work where, because my works are my children. So this is one of the show in London I did, um, yes, a few years back. And then there was a buyer, collector, who wanted to collect these works. I often do some naughty stuff with my works, with my life, with everything. So when it was, there was a potential collector who wanted to buy this work, and my gallery contacted me, the work was still with me that time. So I started defacing the work. It was such a joy. It was such a, you know, interesting um, act, act to overcome that, you know, our greed or something, I don't know, it was not destructing. It was rather kind of a rebirth, you know, I was, I started working with the glow paint over the painting and put it in a dark room and then I started playing with lights. So it become a, and I keep on doing that, so it become a performance. I believe one day it will become the whole painting will become a light. This is in Bangladesh. I found posters, the political leaders with a lot of promises. So I just took out the text because how text actually works in our mind, I often like to see. When there are promises, there are uh, many, you know, uh, things like, you know, uh, hopes. And, and the moment you take this, that literature out, and then you see, for how the people who did not see those promises done by political leaders, how they react, their anger, their frustration, everything, that becomes another language on their faces. So the identity with their names and everything uh, vanished, but there is another identity comes out. And I actually reposted in this village in Bangladesh, all those places. And I asked people like if they can identify their leaders. Another, uh, since I have um, my works related, a lot of works are related with this identity and, you know, like uh, that uh, it's becoming another identity and how we constantly struggle for this identity. This is one uh, curator in um, Birmingham, who invited me for for a for a kind of um, project in his space, huge space, and he gave me all the freedoms he wanted. He said like you can use anything, and he is a very good publisher and a curator. So his beautiful, sophisticated published books, I actually started changing with my images. So he was a bit upset in the beginning. But that tension, because it was a 10 days performance, every day I used to go to that space and do these things, which is quite, um, again, it looks very destructive. 
but the tension between the curator and me was kind of making, you know, like taking both of us in one level or maybe there's nobody, you know, slowly the whole cabinet become one, one work and that, that, third, that doesn't have a real owner or real identity, it becomes something totally different. So both the identities were so all our egos and pride and identities, so like all the struggle actually is nothing. And then I came, I started working on um, my self-identity as like, um, well, I'll just go through because I have so many. There was a show uh, about objects. So when I was thinking about identity and just before this project, I was in New York, I'll show you the show. Um, it was my first solo show in New York and uh, that invitation card after staying there for three months, the invitation card mentioned that artists will be present to talk and meet the people. So that kind of, you know, kind of, um, there was something I just, I don't know, I cannot explain, but I felt like, you know, I mean, how it would be like if I'm just not there, my physical presence is not there, how it would react that first time people coming to see an Indian artist, something. So I left my opening and it was part of my project and then I took everybody's uh, contact and emails. So from next day, I started contacting them personally and I stayed two more weeks to meet them personally. So the whole project was about personal, you know, relationship and tolerance and all those things. So anyway, so after uh, that project, uh, that show, the same gallery invited me for another solo show, like after one or one and a half years, where they made me promise that I will not run away. I said, no, never, because I don't like repeating. That is another issue. <laughs> and um, so this time I made all the works in a huge scale and all about myself. It's that exhibitionism of self and, you know, that sexual self and all these things. So you can see like people came and interacted with, but they are really grotesque and they are me, but not really that me, which I think like we expect. I love making fun and you know like with, because I use here identity as an object. And another thing I really like when people, you know, like watch my works, how they get integrated into a piece of, because I know like art is also like a, at the end it is becoming a product, but still I don't know if art is everything about that product or the final product because it's more like a process, it's living life. I live life with so much of love and passion. I do everything when I, I'm cooking, when I'm, you know, like, uh, putting water on my plants and everything, you know. So how it can be separate from, from life when I'm making something, some art in my studio. So this is one uh, project in Brazil. Uh, I was there for a couple of months and it was, I mean, I often try to articulate myself with a really kind of interesting words. I even write and then I edit, but when I speak, I cannot put them in that format. I just uh, talk like this and um, anyways, that, that, that um, underline of this project was also about the history, the forgotten history, the slavery and um, that silencing um, our voice, gender, everything, because my work is related with that marginal issues which is not necessarily about gender or like you know so when I when I am a feminist if I am a feminist I'm a feminist with with all those issues which are marginalized by many reasons so so this was uh, there is a story because uh, I mean you know, like all my projects mostly have some kind of narratives or stories so uh, I was there and then I found a little icon called Anastasia outside a church in Salvador. And that, that canon is a black um, slave from Angola 
who was brought to Brazil by the white masters and um, who was somehow like for some, who was put a mask for to, you know raising her voice against her white masters. Anyways, uh, she was never been canonized, but she is still worshipped by by the local um, blacks. But you know, it is a true story. It's not like a myth. I was sad seeing that 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 mainstream history in Brazil is never kind of considered this this fact to be in their history book. So it's like a subaltern history, you know, and then people only knows, and a lot of young generation they don't even know. So I met a bunch of girls whom I used to be always, you know, with them, and I, when I started asking them, and they really had no clue about Anastasia, whereas I saw them really like in a very sad things happening in their life. They are they are poor, and there there is a very like the poverty level is really sad, and. Um, no education, the schooling and everything, but they all become want to become like a model or something and want to have um, want to go to America or something like a common trend like this. So what I used to do, I, I wrote a little uh, history uh, or story about Anastasia in Portuguese and um, used to go to the village with my bicycle, made them read the story and I also made a hair mask and ask them to pose for me with this hair mask. Uh, so I made a series of portraits, but in return, I promised them that I will make their portfolio because I had that video camera and camera, so they were very happy. But at the same time, they were, the three months they were learning, it's so a whole village. And I didn't only stop doing their portraits, but then I started doing on Mother Mary and you know the dogs, cats, everything. Because whomever I thought of, you know, kind of become, a, you know, like a metaphor of, you know, like silencing and game. And then uh, I myself also wanted to do, I didn't know how to, you can see, like I talk a lot, so it's hard for me to become silent. And so I wanted to do something and I wanted to do a performance where I don't, I don't scream or cry or talk where I consume the whole, you know, the, the pain of that salvage. I wanted to feel this thing. And I didn't know what to do. So I performed where I, I, I had an idea and I, I, I tattooed myself. And while I was being tattooed, I filmed for 40 minutes till I was busted into like tears. So that was the film. Uh, this is called uh, I Am Not Me. Uh, Borrowed from William Kenridge, last year I was in um, South Africa, in Johannesburg, where I, uh, for a couple of, I mean, I was there almost for two months, and I was marked very classical way, putting gun on my, you know, like, so it was very interesting and exciting. So, and also like a, like, I mean, very intense kind of fear, you know, and trauma also, you know, my physical body was kind of, uh, so I, I couldn't, I couldn't, um, uh, sleep for that night, but next morning I thought, no, I have to overcome that fear because the only thing I hate is like the fear. I always wanted to overcome that fear and reach, and it, because I still believe in this kind of humanity and or love. I'm very idealistic in that way. So next morning I went. I made some posters called human or poet, or because I found these people, they are selling their skills on on the roadside in the highway. So I also tried to sell that basic human, you know, like, and I literally chased the people, the rich people, who used, who was coming and stopping their car for some plumber or electrician, and I just, you know, ran, and I was really abused badly because, you know, I, and there's no woman and other things. So, and then I became very friendly, the same kind, because the first day what happened when I was, like, you know, that kind of traumatized with this kind of incident, I could not look at the people's eye, and I, that I hate, you know, if I cannot look at you, like, cannot look at the eye. So I thought, like, even when I was being marked, I said, like, you were very handsome. So these three, four people, and they're like, so. And in Japan, 2008, I found a very interesting manga comic books in each and every Japanese people's, you know, like, uh, side bag or book or home. So 
but it's like uh, manga is something like a very strong kind of subculture it's like a soft porno kind of graphic novels without almost without any literature and uh, the shy <coughs> japanese people const wants to deny that fact that it's their culture and i constantly impose that it is their culture because it's uh, because for me it was like a high uh, you know like it's a, it's really a kind of high art like you know the, the expression comes out through their suppressed you know culture and it's it's just beautiful so i uh, i was invited there for a couple of months and um, i also love paper a lot of most of my paper works are papers so i wanted to work on kozo paper which is quite a uh, fragile and beautiful uh, uh, experience you can see like and they're big you know like the each paper sheet is like 4 meters by 3 meters so I was making those papers and you know, I was experimenting with these things. But at the same time, I was, I was researching and you know, kind of going through all these experiences about people's, um, I was interviewing people's like, you know, reactions and responses about mangas. And, uh, so what I did is like, I made, made the huge erotic um, uh, images um, of manga where I also kind of put myself as a, one of them. Uh, And then finally, I, I made a box of uh, paper handkerchief where I copied all those little Japanese texts from those books. It's, it was hardly any literature because I asked my friend who tra translated this saying that these are just like some sound effects. So, um, so this kind of orgasmic subtext I put in my, um, in the box and I requested people to you know, kind of engage them. So it was like, again, a kind of game playing because I wanted them to stay longer than they want because they're just like, you know, it's a museum, it's a big museum place and people are just, you know, like running <laughs> away from my sight. But then it really worked well and people engaged themselves and I was very happy that they're And it was traveling a couple of museums in uh, Tokyo, Kyoto, and then uh, in in uh, Korea. But it has been censored after three days of this show. So, in 2011, um, I was invited to do a show with Louis Vito, and that was my first interaction working with a corporate brand. I'm not against brand, but also I don't believe in kind of branding because I do my own branding. If I like something, it's, this is my brand. And it can be Louis Vuitton, it also it cannot be. Anyway, so in the uh, first meeting in 2010, the curator, the in-house curator and another curator from Japan, uh, in a meeting with all those corporate people, they made me promise that I'll not use blood, sex, love, um, not like all those horrific things I used in my work. So I'm not supposed to is because, because it's to entertain their customers. So they want their customers to feel happy so that they can spend more money. So they don't want them to be sad or upset with things. So it was a big challenge for me and I started working So if you see like that uh, image on the left, so it's a little crop from, because these are like uh, big panels, five, six meters by three meters, something like that. So one month before the show, I sent the images to, to my curator and this uh, Louis Vito people. And from there, a big no came. They cannot show my works because it's a lot of, you know, these things. So I, uh, they asked me either I should withdraw from this project or do something. My curator from Japan, who really, uh, you know, insisted me to stay back and said, like, take it as a challenge and do something. But my, again, my, you know, like naughty mind, I mean, I, I told him mean, he's a senior curator. So I said, yes, yes, I'll do. So what I made is like this one on the right hand side. So it completely changed. 
But the trick was there because the work was done in those Kozo paper, which is like the, one of the oldest traditional Japanese paper made out of tree barks. I can paint in layers and each layer stays, you know, like, so they are all like kind of, all the images are actually embedded in the layers. So the last layer was flowers, but when I lit them on the opening day, on the light box, everything camouflaged, everything came out. So, and it was really looking wonderful and everybody laughed. I don't know how much Louis Vito increased their sales, yes. But uh, I, because I have a belief like whomever it may be, rich or poor, everybody is human being. So when they go and see something, experience something which comes from life, it's like there is in like, it. It is the ultimate things, you know. It is uh, this is the ultimate truth. So nobody can deny that. A uh, couple of my shows, uh, an installation. Like I always like to play with the space, and I give them like a home, as I said. So you can see the paintings. I continue. Uh, it's one of my show from 2006, uh, drawing room, where I made a lot of. And yeah, it literally kind of uh, done all over the gallery space and you often discover things and it gives you a kind of feeling because I mean I still don't know what is art, what is high art and what is not art. Whatever you know gives you joy and you feel like you know, uh, like you know you might f uh, find it playful, I mean that's what I'm told, it's playful or something. and. Um, so these are a couple of um, installations. Uh, I, I walk all over, no matter if it is the office room of the gallery or uh, storeroom, I just keep on doing. So because I know like even in the storeroom people go and you know that like the, the people who is working in the gallery they will sometimes, so there should be an atmosphere, there should be a you know like why it should be like just limited in a main space because I had a problem with that main space and not main space like mainstream and not mainstream like this. Uh, this is a couple of, and these are some of the drawings I'll just go through because these are my works are like kind of drawings are sexually overtoned and um, um, sexuality is for me is like you know like it's a confidence because I think um, I don't want to be like marginalized by you know being a woman or being a, somebody coming not from so like you know sophisticated um, elite class or something or whatever. I mean I don't want to ma make you know like this as an issue or cliche word, but I just want to live the way I want and that way I want to cultivate my my own sense of freedom, which is feminism to me. Um, I want, and, and I think in today's in this post-colonial feminism is like that. You you craft your own 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 uh, feminism. It can be just your personal relationship. It may not be like you know your um, your like you know like uh, this big theories or something. I mean because everything is I mean, I mean everything is there. Because the politics of feminism and everything is it doesn't come just it comes in a very natural way. So even if I don't want to subscribe those theory baggages, but still it's there. And I keep myself kind of spontaneous in that manner to react and respond with life. This is from my I Hate Pink show. Uh, this is um, uh, one show in Vienna where I, I mean, I, I know, I, if you know my drawing, they are very sensual, they are very attractive and charming and it, there is a common uh, likings, like nobody can deny that fact because it somehow, it has that kind of very feminine, sensible, um, um, that is called market and with all due respect, because I am a part of that market and the gallery system, I'm saying that I like to constantly critique that my self 
that, that kind of established self where I am already, you know, like uh, skilled in something and I'm invited and I'm, you know, kind of, um, yeah, uh, considered like, you know, as an artist or drawing artist, whatever. So in Vienna in 2009, I was invited to do a show and I stayed there for six weeks. I started going to the museum because Egon Schiele is one of the artists who I like since childhood. And I started going to that museum and copying some of his works from that, uh, from his paintings and made it my own, like, you know, kind of, these days we do, this is an internet age and we get that reference and that, you know, like, everything from net. So, and there is hardly a space to acknowledge. And um, anyway, so I did this series of drawings, which looks, you know, again, beautiful. I made a beautiful painting show and they had two galleries. So one gallery was filled with this. The next gallery, I made a sound piece because while I was doing these things, I was constantly suffering with why I am doing this. I was not suffering in the sense like, you know, suffering, but I was questioning myself. I like to critique my own thing, you know, like I don't want somebody will come and say, uh, though definitely like Girish, I remember like first show, I hit ping, we had a little, <laughs> so, mm. so I want to play a little bit of this sound. I confess, I copied my own work. Again and I again only thought and once again of today. I displayed them I in a different context and different when places many, many, many times. I love I confess. I still age, don't love myself. Reminds me I'm of afraid some other I never works. will. I confess. I confess. I hate being invited for my popular skill love and produce I another bunch of scraps. I'm copying and repeating. After sex. Repeating. I hate the people and pretend they and care, my own but they don't really mean it. Ages. I'm sick and tired to I hear that another Thing will be fine and right today. time will come. I'm really I keep sick. I so am so desperate about myself and I go to I parties. I were leaving I hate someone expect artists to show up, have few days, once and I make some art. art. When I cheat it's my viewers, I still have the size. And so that was my own confession, my personal confessions, and also confession as an artist of our time. Um, in 2006, again, I was invited uh, by a gallery in New York to have my first solo, uh, which I just mentioned. And I was given a beautiful apartment in Chelsea, like 3,000 square feet apartment all alone. And I started making a body of work to have a solo show in their main space, which is in the next street. The whole show, I was, I, the whole project I conceived, it was, uh, it was called It's Good to Be a Queen. When I was there, I started, I mean, I really felt a um, bit lonely and I asked my gallery and I put a note on the door, I was on the fourth floor, uh, that anybody uh, can come and stay some time with me and spend um, and share his or her life along with mine and uh, it will be a dialogue, I'll offer them tea and coffee and all these things. So it was first, it was only friends and then the strangers started coming, which was quite, um, sometimes which was really quite strange. I was trying to um, see my tolerance level, so that there's, and the whole show was conceived as guest host, hospitality and tolerance. And I started working, not pretending as an artist in the residency who is making the work, but really I was making the work because I live and uh, wherever I am, I do something. Uh, whether it should be considered as um, art or not, I don't care. I just live with things I love and I follow my life and heart. So I started making an extended family. They're all my children. So the, all the artworks I was making, I put them, I actually saved my galleries a lot of money by not framing the works and I asked them like, you know, can I do these things even, and I offered the buyers like if they buy one, 
painting they can get the hanger free. I also like, as you say, all these leftovers and whatever in the apartment. I put, I made a, I made my gallery to do a like kind of inventory with the price tags, so that everything I touched, like mirrors, that was the time when 2006, like you know, Indian art, contemporary art booming was really in a high position, and everything was selling art, non-art, whatever. What I was documenting is like the people who were coming all these three months, I was taking a picture before they leave and it was mostly one is to one, it was no, there was no third person. The third person was a camera which had a limited, it was a small camera, limited strength of, you know, you know it was like a hand stretch of distance. So no matter who you are, how friendly and non-friendly or stranger, you have to come close to be in a frame. And then I made two albums of all those people around 150 or 200 people. And I tried to make a, you know, like the little distance and that, you know, kind of thing. I tried to make that psyche of people's negotiation while they confront with a stranger or, you know, like, so. These two books I left on the opening day when I left the... Because all these three months I was making work and uh, meeting people. And I didn't notice that this was my first three months stay in New York. I have to see something, that big country and big city. So I went for a sightseeing. So I went to a city tour bus and that opening night. This is called black candy, not only black candy, it's called black candy in bracket. I forgot my penis at home. Uh, one of the major tool in my practice is provocation, provocation and teasing. I constantly do this thing to provoke my viewer or listener or whomever. So when this black candy, the title came a month before the real show which was which happened like 2010 February so there was a buzz of you know like and I was already by then known for my humor and sexual you know kind of overtone works but the main mission of that show was apart from that that subject that homosexuality or it was not actually only homosexuality. It was again about that marginal whom I wanted to talk about. But what I intended to do is like I wanted to engage my viewer again this time with all of their like you know five human senses. I wanted to explore through my work, through my space. I put all these big um, eight feet by four feet drawings in channels so it was not really easy and smoothing to come to the gallery and see the works you literally you physically have to interact with the works to see the works there was a sound piece i don't want to uh, put that sounds because then i again have to go through like um, so there was a sound which is written by me it was again like kind of found text and uh, from my diary, from everywhere, from uh, placard, from banner, from books, from it's a collage of that sound, text with my kind of English and my kind of grammar, but which is actually me. So again, that identity where I really belong, and maybe I'm dy dyslexic or something. I have a very uh, I have a limit of adapting things. So language is one thing, apart from my mother tongue. Because of that, I think still that ego or pride, I could not adopt another language in a very sophisticated way. But I think, I mean, this is quite easy for me because I can't see any of you. I'm just speaking. It's like a monologue. I'm talking. I'm remembering my works. Makes me feel better. But that struggle I go through, the humiliation, that embarrassment of not speaking um, in a sophisticated manner and accent. Um, 
I don't want to mention or again I, we use the word cliche, that cliche word that colonial, you know, the colonial uh, the colonialism or something. But I went through, you know, to some extent I went through that, but no more. Because now I think I am accepted more as a funny girl, which I really enjoy. And I also want to see, I want to blot that, that border between funny and seriousness. So that is my area, being funny, how one can be serious. So which is, so the text was a bizarre script and again played by me. There are two characters, Ram and Vam. Um, this is uh, one, it's like, like all this one minute or one and a half minutes small snippets where these two characters, Ram and Vam, on their middle age, you know, crisis, like they are going through because both are actually, one is like a homosexual, one is turning to a homosexual who is still suffering from his own identity to, uh, to uh, accept or admit. So that was these things, but it, it also shows many complex layers. Oh, I kept um, the candies in my show. So that viewer was, um, they, they were offered to have candy so that that smell and that taste factor also will work so that our brain will work everything. That smell, taste and that uh, the visual things and then listening and you know touching um, and pushing the works. So it was really like a chaos. And so many of my friends said like the drawings were really very nice and sublime. Why didn't you just slip? But I... I could not agree because I wanted to make that chaos and still experiencing that. Also like the works were too strong and morbid and sexual to divert from that because most of the time what happened my works like are considered to be a, like a very sexual strong sexual imagery which I don't have any problem but it's also not that ultimate focus I always want to uh, project. So, and also like there are a lot of text I used. Even you can see like that no worry, I am water soluble. So even the spelling, the wrong spelling is also like a strong component in my works because I like to write not in a British English or American English but my own English. So when I, act, when I pronounce like soluble in Bengali way, I also write that. It's spontaneous. And I don't know how to correct this. I mean, this is in computer, you go spell and, you know, grammar it does, but not when you talk, because then we have to put some chip in our, some details of that show. So it was like a book, you can, so this, Mo is my sister's name, Museum of Unbelongings. Um, there is a show curated by Ashia Lukandiwala. Uh, uh, it was about museum and archiving. I put a museum of my own collections. I should not say collections because they are my children. Each of, each of them are personalized by name and their story. It's not just at random I put them. And they are all in my house and my studio. They talk about many things, gays, sexuality, race, religion, everything. And I keep on playing with them, keep on talking with them. I have a personal dialogue with them. They have their names. Maybe it's like a hidden desire. I want to see the world and also to value those things which are actually, which actually has no value because they are maybe five rupees, five dollars to like, and they are all like our, this contemporary vernacular cultural memories. It's the popular culture, it's not. So everything by putting them in a pedestal, giving them that importance of a museum was something to get ourselves aware about that valuing things, like valuing stuff, valuing life. And uh, it was a com it's a gallery show. So. At the end, it was like a commercial, so I also had to put a price. I often play with the market by pricing works in a many different ways. So here I put a price, 
saying that they are my children, so they are priceless. You can only adopt them. That means you can give them a new home. You can take them back home. And, um, so that was, this is the book, yeah. So these are like some of my objects with teeth, that series of, I use that, um, because when I use hair, it's like hair from my hair. It's, I use the human hair. Blood is my blood, you know, like, and also teeth are not my teeth. But this is like, I learned this, this dental polymer technique from a dentist, so I, and it's a very um, intense way of making these things, and it's very um, toxic also. And I keep on making this line of, you know, the borders from many places, many galleries. It's almost like biting, it's like, because teeth is like kind of self-defense things, you know, like, and it's also the mouth and the teeth, you know, it's like a gateway from inside and outside. There are many theories, I don't want to so talk about teeth because... And it was like that this teeth proak, I'm going to make a 100 feet long wall uh, this year, end of this year, in a beautiful museum in Michigan. Um, that architect is Zaha Hadid, so it's a 100 feet long space and I'm trying to divide with this teeth wall into two, you know, like... So it's quite exciting and... Um, it's, it, it is about boundary and border, and it's a dialogue between Zaha and my teeth. This is like the pickaxe because this material, um, again, that found material. These are the hair works, I call them unbelongings. Um, this is one of the site specific uh, work in uh, Poland. I had an issue. Most of the time that curators from outside India come with an agenda of doing an Indian show outside India, they always have a package of showcasing India. So most of the time they come, see my works, and then they had to say like me to, these works are not enough Indian, so we don't know where to put you, you know. So it became a crisis again in my, you know, like practice, not because like, because I, I get like more than enough um, like chances to show my work all over the world. But still it was, you know, when, because uh, why I'm not an Indian, I mean, why my works are not in So the next curator who came and before she saw my work, I said, I have a project which is only about Indian. And please take me and give me a space. <laughs> she was quite, of course, she was quite experimental. She said, okay, okay, I'll, I am inviting you. So I sent her a project with a lot of uh, theories and everything about Taj Mahal. I said, you give me a wall, I will make a Taj Mahal. Nobody can deny Taj Mahal is like our identity. <laughs> so it's India. So I came with that big package of identity, <laughs> Taj Mahal. I started working and then I, when she gave me one wall in this huge, beautiful museum, 30 feet by 30 feet like this, I requested if I get a little, little portion of the whole museum in each room. And uh, then she was really kind. She said, yes, but it should not interfere the other artworks or whatever. I said, OK. So I started getting this little, little part of this museum and making Indian Taj Mahal in parts. What I was carrying six and a half kilos were that marble stone, white marble stone from India. So at the end I put a little self and put these souvenirs. So it was little my response of explaining my identity as an Indian and asked people to take the souvenirs back home as a like you know, that dismember. Four play. Um, 2011 um, at Khoj residency, there was a residency about fashion. So the f some fashion designers, artists, photographers, etc., were invited. We all were given one one room. If you are familiar with Khoj in Delhi, um, I really was tempted to do some kind of experimental costume or something. But while I was sitting in this room, I started thinking about that room. The space always, you know, kind of makes some impact on my... And the history of that room, the 15 years that Coach Residence is running every year 
five different artist group comes and they put their own clothing on that room so that room becomes their identity and they color it they make it make their own composition so they really treat their room as a body so i thought of taking that body i mean this is my room and i i when i was there first day that empty room i found a little hole some you know like the layers of that paint came out so i started scratching and then i found like the layers of robes i think like the room was overburdened with these robes so instead of making another robe for this room i thought like this couple of two weeks i think i was constantly taking that clothes off from this beautiful body i gave him some relief this is one of my latest work uh during art fair there are a lot of things happening in the uh, in the city and um, most of the galleries commercial galleries wants show with names i was invited but i was really exhausted with many other things i said like no but then i just thought like i can do something so i asked that gallery if i get a longest wall in in her space and she said okay i came and i started working i chiseled the wall the whole wall and the gallery was sad but i didn't want my name to be there as an artist that all we go through this phase and there are so many of us still constantly applying waiting for a response from the gallery and many things i don't like but they are mostly unanswered uncalled undesired unwelcome so it was a tribute to all those unknown artist and also it was from my side it was to claim that space like uh, in my it's good to be queen i didn't show my works when i oh, i forgot to tell that in it's good to be queen show when i almost was finished all my works that gallery wanted to have all these works in their main space to have the solo opening and all so i i said like i have my last request can we invite because it was just across the road i said can we invite those artists in this apartment so the my intention was to change that concept of main space so i changed that space into my and i welcome them to my home or my apartment and i so this is also again about claiming that space i like to challenge that you know like the institutions and in my own way very personal way or maybe emotional way so that was a work by all those artists and for them and this is a this is just a proposal two years back i wanted to do a room in a private museum of a collectors um so what i propose is like i wanted to do an empty room but it was not to complicate that project by the curator and that uh museum director but to complement all that objects or all that artworks they had in their collection but also to question about the position also also to criticize anyways it didn't happen it i was refused but for me i think i was very much there with that absence so and that that proposal was called no thing and it was about making home this is the divide but um i cannot show you it's, it's it's it looks like a beautiful painting show but actually it the i worked with the programmed lighting 
So the light changes and there are two layers of works. One is like just drawings on the paper and another layers on acrylics and this all the shadow that these drawings are shadows. So it actually constant, it's a moving, it's a constantly moving lights and it's like a film. Um, but we will not get it from the steel images. And this is one of the last thing I want to share. This is called Free Me Too. It also it was launched in 2007, early 2007, um, when that art market, as I said, like was really like abstract and absurd. I I mean I definitely enjoy selling my work, using that and you know like that in my life and doing all these things, but which I could not take emotionally was that, that absurdity of price hiking and making that, you know, that, that politics of making the price game. It happened in front of my eyes. Today that my painting was like 20 rupees, tomorrow it was 200, day after it was 2000. So it's like, so within six months I, I saw this, it was 2006 when I went through this experience, I just felt I how can I deal this emotional, you know, setbacks? Because personally, I was getting aloof from my immediate circles, my family, and I started constantly being questioned. And people asked about art. Who doesn't really know about art? Is that really have so much of value? And that value is a currency. So I wanted to change that currency, which is like if my this much of painting is like a salary of my father's whole year, and that struggle and that suffering. I mean, I'm not devaluing art, but I'm just saying that that emotional impact which really made me very um, down that period and uh, to overcome from this because I didn't want to leave art. I had no problem of making art or working with this uh, galleries or market, but I thought I will make one project where my art practice or my some of my artworks will not go through the market with some kind of currency. It will be only an exchange of pure, you know, love or something. I was very idealist, but because there were also like lot of complexes, people, I, I offered people to send me a letter with love because I wanted just the time from them so that they can uh, give me in my, you know, like in response, not a check. But, um, it went through many things and um, for two years I uh, collected plenty of letters, personal letters and everything is well documented. I had somebody who was helping me, which is, we are over flooded and objects and personal things, everything and even coach offered me the space to, uh, to uh, give the artworks which I was making for two years for the people. Uh, as a letter of love, again that space was given, uh, so if what not, I got everything. And all the artworks I was making, I put them in a little bag I designed, it's uh, just pillow covers because it's my dream project and I wrapped everything and I asked, it was forbidden to open uh, those, uh, those uh, paintings because the moment they open they start comparing. So I was also going through that human psyche, the people's psychology of getting um, a free thing because the value of free is like in one point we say nothing is free that's true nothing was free it was not free because people gave me their time from their life five minutes two minutes they wrote some letters or something At the same time free has been kind of um, corrupted and um, I had a blog First you have to go through this um, uh, registration through internet and which was very again humorous and uh, like a joke that you have if you love Shah Rukh Khan or Jackfruit or if you, if you um, have a, if you have a family physician. So a lot of people thought it's a joke but uh, it was not and um, it, it gave me many things, it, it educated me in many ways with human behavior and uh, uh, people's uh, psychology and understanding about art and since it was put on a website so it was like in a public domain from all over the world people responded there was a lot of young collectors who wanted to have a work of me that period and they were invited but with the promise that they will 
maybe they had little money like with, with that money which was not um, sufficient for their the desired work of me so I invited them and gave them the work and I made them to buy another young artist work with that money they you know kind of had so lot of lot of layers lot of things happen and I'm still doing it but now I'm more selective because first two years it was whomever applied but now I went through interesting experiences and um, I'm also but it's my lifelong project and I I want to it, it has no deadline because I'm we otherwise we are always in a deadline we have to finish we have to frame we have to all these things and there is no uh, pushing that when when I can get my works and all these things I said like in my lifetime so lifetime is that a line I don't know I'm talking too much I think I thank you I've done it Thank you.